Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me on our True Crime Wine Wednesday. I just wanna thank you guys so much for like making me love Wine Wednesday again. I always love like a good Wine Wednesday with my girlfriends back in the day, you know, pre-growing a family and pre-2020. Those days are a distant memory now. When I see you guys tell me how much you love Wednesdays, it just makes me love Wednesdays like so much more. And then I'm so glad that like you guys are feeling the Wednesday love, like I'm feeling the Wednesday love and you look forward to Wednesdays as much as I look forward to Wednesdays. Wednesday's a new day. You guys just make my heart burst. Before we get started, I have another merch update. I know like every Wednesday lately, I've got a merch update, but I just wanna let you guys know if you have ordered crew necks, you might be finding that your orders are taking a little bit longer we like broke the system with the crew necks. I didn't realize how much you guys were gonna love those so much. So two of the printers that we were already using, like they completely sold out of them and had to outsource different companies to get the same quality that I really wanted in those. So if you're feeling like it's taking a little bit of time, please be patient. I thank you guys so, so much. I just wanted to communicate with you and put it out there. That's the reason why it might be taking a little bit longer. All right, let's get right into today's case because there is a lot of urgency in this one. Today we are talking about Leslie Palacio. And if you also follow Danielle Hallen, you'll see that she has also done a video on this a couple weeks ago. And in her video, she expresses the importance of getting Leslie's story out there as soon as possible. So when Leslie's sister personally reached out to me, I was absolutely honored to also do my part and try to help as much as I can to gain as much exposure as possible for the Palacio family. If you aren't familiar with Leslie's story, Leslie was a 22 year old who went missing on August 29th of 2020, so just a few months ago. She was last seen with a family acquaintance that the family had known for over 15 years named Eric Rangel. And almost two weeks after she was reported missing, her remains were found. And since then, Eric and his father Jose have been on the run. We don't know too much about what kind of evidence the police have surrounding the case there are warrants for their arrest so just by going off of that and piecing together the evening that Leslie had with Eric it's safe to say that they are very confident that that is who is responsible for taking Leslie's life and when you hear this story and how he and his family have acted I mean it just completely reaffirms it as well. I want to start this video by sending a huge thank you to the Palacio family, particularly Leslie's younger sister, Kaylee, who has helped me put this case together. I know you guys really love getting to know who we're talking about in these cases as much as I do. So having firsthand account from her family has just taken it to a whole new level for me and I know it will for you guys too. Thank you Palacio family for reaching out. Myself and my YouTube family love you so much. We're sending you so much support as well. While talking to Leslie's sister Kaylee, there's absolutely no denying what a phenomenal woman she was and what a loss this tragedy is not only to the Palacio family and her friends, but to the world. Leslie was born on May 5th, 1998 to Araceli and Osiel Palacio. She is the second oldest of five children and she took her role as an older sister very seriously. Not in the sense of like, I'm the boss, like you have to listen to me, but she was just a natural, like maternal being. She was basically a second mother to her siblings. Their mom worked very hard. She worked long hours. And so Leslie took it upon herself to be the one to take care of the younger kids. She would be the one changing their diapers, giving them baths before bedtime, cooking their meals. When her mom was home after a long shift at work, it was Leslie who was like shooing her out of the kitchen so that she could cook for her and let her mom rest. Like she just, she did it all and she did it with a smile on her face and absolute positivity in every aspect of her life. 
Kaylee said that was the one of the things that she misses the most about her is just how positive she was and how she was able to see the good in every situation, even if it wasn't ideal, you know? She'd take her moment, vent about something was going on, and then immediately shift her focus to something positive about the situation. Kaylee said Leslie always wanted the best for her family, particularly her younger siblings. She would say to them all the time, don't be like me, learn from my mistakes. And this really touched me because I could relate to that. I'm the oldest of my siblings and that's something I do all the time. I'm always like, hey, this was the path I took. These were the mistakes I made in it. Do better than me. Learn from them. I did them so you don't have to. And then hearing Kaylee's perspective, it just pulled on my heartstrings because I never get to hear that side. I would always be like Leslie in that situation where I'm like, don't do this. And she's the one looking up to her sister. And she said, you know, like just seeing where Leslie was in life and how good she was doing, how positive she was, how wonderful she was, how much everybody wanted to be around her. She's like, I mean, if I followed the exact same path as you, I'm going to do okay. Her family said Leslie was just the one that everybody wanted to be around, not just her family, but also her friends. And her family said she had a bunch of friends. They said that they were actually so surprised how she was able to maintain and nurture as many friendships as she did. It sounds like she was the one that everybody thought was like their best friend. She made everybody feel like that one-on-one -on -one intimate connection and everybody just loved her. In elementary school her friend said she was the one who was very shy at first and then when she got out of her shell she would sacrifice herself doing silly things as goofy as you could possibly get just to put a smile on somebody's face and just to make their day brighter and everybody happier. And as they got older she was the one that everybody also went to for advice. Her little sister said she gave the best advice and it's something that she misses so much every single day. After Leslie graduated she went to college to become a phlebotomist and she was actually supposed to graduate this January of 2021. While she was in school she was working in a retail store as a cashier and her sister said it definitely wasn't you know her life goal. She was working towards her school and getting good grades but it was a job to get her through and again her sister would always see that positive side to her because some days she'd get in the car after a shift and she'd be like oh my god like people I'm telling you she'd have to deal with like disgruntled customers but then she'd be like but I love it because so and so I got to work with today I love my co-workers if you've worked retail you can totally relate to this like people are fucking dicks man and I don't get it because when I'm shopping I'm so excited I'm like yes take my money but I, I I worked retail and I can I can definitely relate to that like people are just like on another level sometimes but Leslie wouldn't dwell too much on it and she really just liked getting together with her co-workers after their shift they would go out have drinks together very typical of 22 year old but her family said over this past year that she'd been in school she was really focusing on being as successful as possible and getting really good grades so she had taken a step back and wasn't going out as often it sounds like a it was a time that her family really loved having because she was around them more. Her little sister liked coming into her room and just seeing her experimenting and playing with new looks with makeup and she'd like ask her if she was going to go out somewhere and Leslie would be like no I'm not really into it anymore. I just want to try out this look and this technique I saw or like just kind of release some stress from studying, take a little bit of a break. Again, like if you're super into makeup, like that's so relatable and really a great like stress reliever, especially if you suffer from anxiety. I know a lot of people just love to like put a brush in their hand, do their own thing, and then you wash it off later. She also really liked to do her older sister Corelli's makeup. The two of them shared a room together and their little sister Kaylee told me that they even talked about wanting to start their own YouTube channel. Things like beauty and just like talking about their lives and stuff and it's just, it puts things into perspective of like how sad this is that we will never get to see that. Just by learning about Leslie's personality and her positivity and seeing her insane abilities and skills in makeup, it's such a loss to a platform like this. 
as I was talking to Kaylee, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, what would have come of that? Would we have all been able to see her? Would she have made it big? YouTube has such an amazing way of just connecting people from far away. And I wondered if, uh, you know, her channel would ever have come on my suggested videos to watch. And it just broke my heart. And it's, a, it's an opportunity none of us will ever get because the Palacios have had to deal with one of the biggest betrayals and tragedies that I can think of. Not only having Leslie taken away from them, but having her taken away from somebody that they knew for a long time and that they trusted. His name is Eric Rangel, and like I said, the importance of getting this story out is that they know who they're looking for, they just can't find him. The Palacio and Rangel family knew each other for over 15 years. I was told they met in a store and that Leslie's mother, Araceli, very much like Leslie, was very positive, upbeat, friendly, and struck up a conversation with Eric Rangel's mother, whose name is Guadalupe. And from that point, they formed a friendship. Primarily, they would do things like go to church or go over to each other's house and celebrate like certain either religious celebrations or like family traditions together. And there was definitely a time that they were, you know, quite close and shared a lot. When Leslie was 15 and her quinceanera was coming up, Guadalupe actually offered to be Leslie. Leslie's godmother. Now I've seen this sh shared a lot and being such a primary focus in this story. So I wanted to know about it and see like had they been best friends forever and that Araceli couldn't imagine anybody else being Leslie's godmother besides Guadalupe and it didn't really work out like that. It was more so like Guadalupe offering to be her godmother like oh she needs one like I'll do it and Araceli just being kind. Are you gonna be like no thank you. <laughs> So she agreed. Leslie's sister only remembers going to the Rangel house one time. She said when she went, it was one of those situations where when they got there, the parents hung out and did their own thing downstairs. And then the kids went upstairs and hung out in one of the bedrooms. And she said that day, she just had the weirdest feeling about Eric. It wasn't something particular. It wasn't something she could put her thumb on, but it was just something about him. And he didn't say or do anything. He was just kind of like sitting off in the corner, but she said he seemed very like hyper-focused, obsessed almost with like watching Leslie. So when they left, she had brought it up to Leslie and Leslie didn't notice it. And she didn't really think that he thought anything of her. So Kaylee was just like, okay, well, if she's not concerned, maybe I'm just getting this feeling just like from something else. Maybe I just like don't like his vibe. I don't know what it is, but it was just one of those like gut feelings that she had and didn't forget. At some point in the relationship between the Palacio and the Rangel family, they kind of kept their distance. There wasn't particularly a big falling out or anything like that. Leslie's mom was just almost doing like a spring cleaning of friendships and this was one of them. By no means did they argue or anything like that. In fact, they lived in the same community as each other. So Guadalupe would drive by the Palacio house she would stop by and come in and say hello really quickly. So they were still cordial and acquaintances. They just weren't doing like the same hangout celebrations, that kind of stuff as they were before together. And Leslie and Eric also didn't appear to have any form of relationship besides just having that connection that their family knew each other and just seeing each other at those events. And since that had stopped, it had been quite some time since they've seen each other. And then it was in March, 2020 that Leslie gets a message on Instagram and it says, hey, it's Eric, your neighbor. And just to give a little bit of perspective of like how not close they were, Leslie had to reply back like Eric who? It didn't even click to her that it could be him even though they lived in the same area, even though their families had been close at one point, they weren't close, the two of them at all. And he needed to reply back, oh, Eric Guadalupe's son. And then that's when Leslie realized who he was. And then they just chatted here and there on Instagram from that point forward. We don't really know what their correspondence was like. As far as Kaylee knew, they never met up before prior to the night of August 29th. On that night in particular, Leslie does agree to go out with Eric. Her family says on that evening, nothing was out of the ordinary. It was a very 
typical evening. She had cooked chicken and bell peppers with her mom. She spent some time with Kaylee in her bedroom. And her mom said she was in really high spirits and like her giggly self. Later in the night, we know that Leslie was texting with her older sister, Corelli. Her sister was at a friend's house and Leslie and Corelli were very close in age. And so they shared a lot of the same friends. And Leslie was wanting to go over to the friend's house and hang out with them, but it was getting later in the night. And so when she talked to her mom about it, her mom just expressed that she didn't feel comfortable with it. She wanted her to stay home. It was getting dark and she didn't like her going out into that area around that time. So Leslie said to her sister that she was just gonna stay home. So her mom goes to bed and Kaylee and Leslie are hanging out again in Leslie's room. And Kaylee says she didn't know of her talking to Eric at all. She knew she was texting with Corelli and they were FaceTiming together at some point. And then at 11 p.m., Kaylee decides she's gonna go to bed. So she says goodnight to Leslie and that's the last time she sees her older sister. The next communication to her family is another text that Leslie sends to her sister Corelli. She let her sister know that she's left the house to go and have some drinks and some food at the Longhorn Casino with Eric Rangel. Security cameras pick up Leslie and Eric arriving in his white Ford F-150 around 12.30 and nothing seems out of sorts. They go have some drinks and eat, and then they leave around 1.50 a.m. From there, they go to another bar called Putter's Bar and have some more drinks. Leslie is still communicating with her sister. She sends her a photo. She says she's on her sixth shot and that Eric is on a diet. I don't know if this means that, you know, he's not drinking and she's gonna be drinking for them and just indulging, or if he's not having as much as her, but she makes mention of that. And then from an article that I read, there's surveillance video of them going to another bar called Bourbon Street sports bar and allegedly you can see Eric on the surveillance video. I personally couldn't find it though so I haven't seen it. And then at 440 is the last communication that anybody ever had with Leslie. She sent a text to her older sister Corelli again and it said, dude, I have to talk to you about some shit. Her sister then says she could see the text bubbles come up so she knew that she was trying to text more to her. And then all of a sudden it stopped. So she was like, what, what's going on? Curious, wants to know. And she says that originally her questions are coming through blue and then they go to green. So if you have an iPhone, you know that that means that either their phone's dead or it's turned off. Next at 6 a.m., Eric is picked up on a neighborhood surveillance camera. I also personally have not seen this video. I don't know if it's being concealed for evidence for the police, but according to the video, you see Eric Rangel pull into his driveway and he goes to the passenger side and he looks to be assisting Leslie out of the car and assisting her to the door. So we don't know if she's had too much to drink. Regardless, Leslie is not walking herself confidently to the door. Eric is assisting her there. 45 minutes later, Eric is seen again, and this time he's leaving the house without Leslie and without a shirt on. He's gone for about a half an hour, and then at 7.15, he arrives back, and now he's not alone. He gets out of the car, and so does an individual who appears to resemble the description of his father, Jose Rangel. They are briefly in the house and next they are seen carrying out a limp body that appears to be Leslie out of the house and into the back of Eric's truck. On this footage before they drive away you can also see Jose Rangel go back to the front of the driveway and walk the path that they just did but he's got a hose in his hand and he's watering down the driveway. Now around exactly this time at the Palacio house Leslie's mom Araceli is waking up and her routine was always to just wake up check on the girls see how their night was and when she goes to Leslie's room she sees that Leslie's not there but Corelli has now arrived home and she asks where her sister is. Corelli tells her she said that she went out with Eric last night and again like Leslie's reaction Araceli says Eric who and she says Eric Rangel. Immediately her mom is uncomfortable and then the situation just escalates really really fast because Corelli tells her about this last 
communication she had with her and says that she's starting to get a little bit panicked because at this point now she still hasn't talked to Leslie. Their mom asks her to start messaging everybody that she knows, anybody that she can think of that also knows Eric. So Corelli is able to get in touch with Eric's sister Karen and it appears that she's willing to do everything that she can to help her. She says she'll call Eric and see if she can get a hold of him which she does call but is not successful getting through to him so she lets her know you know this is the truck that he's driving if you want to go out and keep an eye out for it I'll give you his number provided his number and also suggested going to the family house to see if he had made it there and maybe his phone was missing somewhere and to ask the family if they've seen him as well. Corelli said from that point on she tried calling Eric repeatedly to no avail. So she decided to go to the Rangel house with a close friend of her and Leslie's and see if she could find her there. She said when she got there, they could hear people on the inside like rustling around, but no one would come to the door. So this is the first red flag of like, okay, why are they avoiding us? Like they know our family, they can see who we are through the door. What the heck is going on? So she goes back to her mom's house to just let her know that they went there and that no one's answering and willing to talk to them. So from that point, their mother, Araceli, she's hysterical. She's got that maternal instinct just screaming at her that something's wrong. So she repeatedly starts calling Guadalupe's cell phone to see if she's heard from her son and might happen to know where her daughter is. I think it was like on the third or fourth call, she finally gets a call back from Guadalupe. And this phone call does not go as you would anticipate it would be, especially from somebody that you've known for 15 years. She's described as being very cold. She tells Araceli that Eric is a grown man. She doesn't get in his business. He's allowed to do what he wants. If he's gone somewhere, who is she to question where and what he's doing? So Leslie's mom is like, something is not right. And she hangs up the phone and she goes straight over to the Rangel house. She's also with her daughter Corelli and one of Leslie's good friends who had gone to the house prior with her. And when they get there, now Eric's sisters, Evelyn and Ashley, are standing on the driveway. And there's a random vehicle that the Palacio family doesn't recognize. And the two girls are loading furniture from their house into this vehicle. And they're wearing like surgical gloves. So Leslie's mom's like, you know, what the heck is going on? What an odd day for you to allow people to come and purchase items that you're trying to sell online. What the heck is going on? So she's crying and she's just begging her friend Guadalupe for any advice or any direction on where she could look. And she's even saying to her, look, like our children are missing. Like we need to work together. You also don't know where your son is. Why am I the only one who's hysterical here? Like we need to find them. And she's met with the same just like stone cold wall response from her that she got on the phone. And she it told her, I don't get in his business. I don't know if he's missing. I just don't know where he is. And I don't know where your daughter is. Which again, Araceli just can't wrap her head around because she's she's like, why aren't you worried that maybe something happened and they're stranded somewhere and their cell phones died? Maybe somebody has them, you know, maybe they've been in a horrible accident and they're at the hospital and we should go and look for them. Like, am I in the twilight zone? So as they're having this conversation and it's getting really emotional, like a switch Evelyn and Ashley, Eric's sisters, go to like almost attack at Corelli and Leslie's friends and they just start screaming, where's Eric? Like maybe you know where Eric is. And they all, like they start to like try to fight them. And I realize that people like deal with tra traumatic and hectic and chaotic situations differently. But I try to put myself in that situation where if it was my brother that was also missing with like a family friend's daughter or sister, I wouldn't be rushing them trying to fight them like I, I'd want to work together and be like yeah um let's compare texts let's compare find my iPhone information like what can we do to get a hold of these two so the Palacios are like we need to get out of this situation because it's just not making any sense so they tell them we're gonna go to the police and the Rangel crew they reply back with like yeah you go to the police again 
like your brother and son are missing, if I was concerned and I truly felt like that my sibling was missing or my son was missing, I'd be like, perfect. Are we going to take my car or yours? Like scooch over. I'm hopping in and driving on over there with you. So they go to the police station and they file a report, but basically that's all they can do. Leslie is an adult. They can't really get anywhere. And they're just left with the response of like, she she's an adult. She can be missing if she wants to. The Palacios cannot accept this as an answer though. They're like, we need to do more. So they decide they want to go back to the Rangel house. They know something is going on just by the sketchiness that's freaking surrounding that place. And when they get there, the house is pitch black, but they know everybody's home. Again, like in the morning, they can hear people wrestling around. And now they're also like peeking through the blinds, blatantly showing them that they're home, but they don't want to answer. So the Palacios call the police and they're just like, panicked because they want to communicate with this family. They need answers from this family. They feel like they're the only ones who can give them what they need and they're just like shutting them out. So they wait at the Rangel residence and it takes the police over five hours to get there. And when they finally get there, they too are trying to knock on the door, get somebody to answer. No one does. And one of the officers decides to call Guadalupe's cell phone and she answers and says yeah like I know you guys are there we're not coming to the door though we're in the middle of dinner just gonna go over it one more time like remember she's also telling the Palacio family that she doesn't know where Eric is so as far as she can is concerned he's also missing but she can't answer the door to the police because she's having dinner unfortunately that's all the police could do they couldn't do anything Eric was grown he was allowed to be missing Leslie was 22 years old she also was allowed to and they said that the Palacios could file a missing persons report but they had to wait 72 hours again they're not just gonna sit back and take this they go to the grind talking to Leslie's younger sister Kaylee I cannot even and tell you how phenomenal and strong this young woman is. Leslie would be so unbelievably proud of her. This kid called every single news station that she could think of just to get exposure for her sister's story and try to get her face out there for people to see as quickly as possible. They also went to social media and started sharing her story. They went and made flyers and posted them all around the city. I mean, they, they never stopped. As the story is being shared on social media, one of Leslie's good friends shares it on her Instagram story and she gets this private message back from this like blocked account and the message says for $10,000 we'll return Leslie to you. Naturally like her mind is going in a million different directions but the first thing she asks is how do I know this is real? So they reply back, you send us $5,000 and we'll send you a picture. And when you send the other $5,000, we'll give you Leslie. So she forwards this message on to Leslie's older sister, who then takes it to the police. And she's like, see, I told you, like something is going on. Somebody has my sister. This isn't just her up and leaving and not talking to us. Like we communicate all day, every day. So this event seems to be what snapped the cooperation for the police to be involved into searching for Leslie. Unfortunately, it just led to somebody who was trying to torment the Palacio family, which is just so disgusting. But just to give you guys an insight of how wonderful the Palacios are, when I spoke to Kaylee about it, she told me that, you know, although it didn't lead to anything, and yes, like it's just so disturbing that somebody would do something like this to your family when you're in this moment of like, trauma and grief and panic like looking for your family member she said that she was thankful that it did because that was the event that made her family be taken seriously by the police it was those moments in the call with Kaylee that I just I could truly feel the positivity that she was talking about that Leslie had and it's something they clearly all have. And they just sound like such an amazing family. You better believe, like if somebody reached out to me and was like trying to capitalize and get money from me or my family when something like this was going on with us, like 
That's a whole side of Sherilyn that stays tucked deep, deep down in like a little box that would like explode out. The kind of person it would take to do that to a family to try to like extort money from them in a time like this there's like there's a whole exhibit in our Jurassic jail specifically for people like that. This Jurassic jail's really got to get underway because like our blueprint is getting larger and larger. Unfortunately, with social media being like the primary source to help the family and spread the word and and Leslie's picture and get this story out there, it definitely has its downside, but it also has its positive sides, but you're kind of left with receiving all of these leads and I can assume how over overwhelming it can be like people are coming left right and center trying to help for the most part and you don't really know like what to sift through and take seriously so several people had reached out and said that they had seen Leslie or they had seen Eric or Leslie and Eric within the California area. So Araceli and Corelli, they decide to go to Riverside, California, which is where they knew that the Rangel family had some family ties. While they're there looking for Leslie on September 5th, Kaylee said the police came to their house and they asked if the family had a toothbrush of Leslie's that they could take with them. Kaylee said she obviously knew that they had found something in her mind. She never wanted to go to a body, but she was hoping that it could be evidence or something that was going to tie them to the next step of this investigation and finding Leslie. And four days later on September 9th, the police call Araceli's cell phone and she's looking still for Leslie. She's feeling resentful, like, why am I hitting the pavement every single day? I feel like I'm unsupported. I feel like no one's helping me. And they basically just tell her, stop your searching and you need to come home. When they get home, the police meet them there and this is where they tell the Palacio family that they have found the body of Leslie. She was over an hour away from their house in the desert around the Valley of Fire State Park. They wouldn't give them too much details, but they said it appeared that she had been dead for the full 10 days that she had been missing and out in the desert. After they notified the family on this day, they officially release a warrant for the arrest of Eric Rangel and not only him, but also his father, Jose Rangel. Like I mentioned, the police have not shared much of the details that are going on behind the scenes. But what we know just from social media and stories being shared is that they couldn't even get a hold of the family to try to reach out to them to see if they knew where Eric and Jose were because the day that Leslie was reported deceased, the Rangel family just ups and moves from their home. People then came forward saying since the day that Leslie had been missing, they had been selling off furniture and neighbors kept seeing more and more random cars arriving to their home. And then they'd come out and they'd pack up the vehicle with all of their belongings. So I don't know if it was planned that in the event that Leslie ever was going to be found, that was the day that they up and leave or if it was just coincidence, but the family moves from the house. and. And Leslie's family is just left in absolute grief and heartache. As much as you want to find your family member and have some form of closure, you want to find them alive. You never want to realize that they're never coming back home to you. When Kaylee shared these moments with me, I was so touched that she wanted to, but it broke my heart. She told me that the family just wanted more information from the police and they couldn't get any. And then they asked if they could see Leslie and just hold her say goodbye or just something and just know that it was Leslie and they refused they said they weren't allowed to see her it wasn't a good situation even when they asked if they could just see her feet or touch her hand they weren't allowed I understand from covering these cases that that's very common to happen oftentimes police will do that to save the family any further grief and trauma but something that rubs me the wrong way with how this case has been dealt with is that's actually the last communication that the Palacio family has had with the police from this moment forward. And it's a pain and frustration that you can definitely feel and very understandably. Basically everything the Palacios know about Leslie's case is from media that the police are sharing with the news and they're finding out in real time at the same moments 
all of us are. Again, I realize there's a reason why maybe certain things are concealed from family members or the public, but these are, you know, like when it's situations where they're willing to share information publicly with a news reporter, I personally, if I was in this situation, would be really upset that this is my family member I deserve to know before anybody else. And that's how the Palacio family feels and I feel for them. So going off of clues and timelines and events that have been shared with um, acquaintances of people who knew the Rangel family and people who know the Palacio family, the best timeline that we have of what Eric and his dad's path was from the 29th on is that in the early morning hours of the 29th after his dad and him are seen on surveillance video, Eric calls a friend from a burner phone and he tells them that he needs his help filling up a gas can for him because he can't be seen on surveillance video. And when the friend asks him, you know, like what's going on? Why can't you be seen? Eric's reply is, I killed a blank. I killed a blank. She's dead in the back of my truck. I learned after reading this that this friend reached out to Leslie's older sister, offered his condolences, and wanted to make sure that she knew that he had nothing to do with what happened to Leslie and she said that after that message was sent he just like kind of went black on social media all of his accounts were deleted and mutual friends have said that they've seen him around and he's also expressed that he had no involvement but I don't know if he's communicated much with the police or where that all falls because what people are saying now is that he's also upped and left his house. I mean, I don't think that he has anything to do with what happened to Leslie. Perhaps he's feeling guilty about speaking to Eric after and maybe not coming forward sooner. I'm not sure. But I know that the family is wondering, you know, like, is it a coincidence that you left and move? And like, we can't ask you more questions. Like they want, I think, to ask him some more stuff and get like a little bit of clear insight of how that whole conversation went down and they just can't at this time. Next, Eric's sister Karen said the last time she saw Eric after Leslie was missing, he looked extremely stressed out. He was like frantic, very short, and he was just like rushing to pack his bags. And then that was the last time she saw Eric or Jose. Next, we know that Eric and his dad spent the night at a family member's house in Moreno, California. Allegedly, they asked this family member to help them cross the Mexico border, but the family member refused to do that for them. So although we don't know for sure if they arrived in Mexico, it's safe to say that the intention was there if they were asking. Plus, the police a few days later had located Eric's truck in a parking lot of a bus stop in Paris, California. I'm not overly familiar with California like demographics, but it seems to be like heading south towards Mexico. So it does seem like that plan to get there was still forging forward. As far as the Wrangell house, we don't know what day this was, whether they were home, whether there was somebody who let them in and wanted to cooperate, but the police have said that they did get into the Wrangell house at some point and that they did find human blood within Eric's bedroom, but they wouldn't say whose it was or elaborate further. They've just said it's human blood. I feel very confused by like the breadcrumbs that the police seem to be leaving on this case. Like I've already said, and I, I understand that for evidence sake, like not everything can be exposed, but there's just certain things that I feel like I don't understand why they can't be. So maybe for evidence, I can understand if they don't want to say if it's Leslie's blood or not in the home. But this next piece, I'm very confused by. The police have shared that they have received a ping notification from Jose Rangel's iPad on the like find my iPad feature and it pinged from a location in Mexico, but they don't want to share where. I, I try to make sense of it and I, I just, I can't. Like you have it plastered everywhere that you have a warrant for these two individuals arrests. There's no like hiding that they're clearly your main suspects in this case. Wouldn't you want people who had connections in Mexico to share this information with them, keep an eye out, help the investigation? I just, 
I'm trying to understand what the reasoning is that they don't want to share where it pinged from and I, I can't understand. One thing we've also seen on social media is that there is a lot of speculation that the Rangel family has been involved in human trafficking. When I asked the Palacio family about this, they were not aware of any of that prior to hearing about it on social media as well. But since that has become something that people are sharing these days and some people even sharing personal or like secondhand stories of people that they know, the Palacios have had people who reach out to them who have also brought this up. One woman has gone on social media and asked when her daughter was going to get the justice that she deserved and when she was asked about it she said that her daughter had gone out to a party with Evelyn and Ashley Rangel and has never been seen since. I just want to make this clear this is just somebody's story from social media. There hasn't been anything that I've seen that's been looked into it so this is something that allegedly happened. There was also a neighbor of the Rangel family that reached out to the Palacios and they were trying to help them in the very early stages of the search for Leslie. They said that they had video footage from their doorbell camera of a young woman who resembled Leslie and it looked like she was very afraid of something and she was trying to get into their house and she kept looking back at the street behind her almost like she's like making sure that no one's following her but like in a panic to get in because she's running away from somebody. When the Palacio saw this footage, they, they realized it wasn't Leslie, but as far as they know and we know, this woman has never been found or identified. I guess without knowing who these women are and more about their stories, this is all again speculation but if you're watching and you know this woman and that she's possibly missing please let the Las Vegas Metro Police Department know at 702-828-3521. You also can submit a anonymous tip by calling Crime Stoppers at 702-385-5555. And if you are in Mexico or know anybody in Mexico, please share this story like crazy. I don't ever ask for my videos to be shared unless it's in situations like this. And I really, really would love if we could get as much exposure as possible out there for Leslie. Jose Rangel is about five feet, six inches tall. He weighs about 173 pounds and has brown eyes and black hair. Jose Rangel is five feet, nine inches tall and weighs about about 200 pounds. He has brown eyes, black hair, and a medium complexion. And investigators say he has a tattoo on his ear of the state of California, a tattoo on his chest of a skull, and a tattoo on his left wrist of a Dragon Ball Z image. So anybody with information, please contact the Las Vegas Police Department at 702 828 3521. Again, you can also remain anonymous at Crime Stoppers at 702-385-5555. You can actually also send an email directly to a homicide at LV mpd.com. When I asked Leslie's sister how we could support her and her family, she mentioned that they had a GoFundMe set up a while ago that was in place to help recuperate some of the costs of the funeral expenses. I want to share that link with you guys in the description below so that if you want to, you can send something to the Palacios and help them out. I just want it to be known though that this family is so unbelievable that when I offered to do this, like like, this isn't something that they wanted or asked for and I know that they are definitely going through hard times right now not only with losing Leslie but the situation we're in right now with 2020 and Araceli was actually in the process of starting her own business and it was Leslie who was encouraging her and helping her get everything set up and right before Leslie went missing Araceli actually had just booked her first contract with her cleaning company but with the limitations that we have on guidelines right now and how businesses are allowed to operate and then on top of that dealing with grief on a day-to-day -day basis I'd love to be able to give back in some way to the family and help them out 
even if it's just a little bit. I'd love to do what we can just to make things just a little bit easier for them. At the end of the day though, I know that this isn't something that they asked or expect or wanted. I know that the family's main focus is to get justice for Leslie and to get the story out there. So it is absolutely okay if you are not in the position to donate at this time, but please, please share the story. The family also has a Facebook page for Leslie, so I'm going to link that in the description as well. And you can head over there and follow as things develop. You can also send the family your love and support that way. Whatever we can do to help, I want the Palacios to know that our true crime Fab Wine family has got their back. That is it for me today, you guys. Thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you for the shares in advance. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. You know I love and I appreciate you so, so much. I will see you in the next video and I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.